Thank you. Thank you, Shubham, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone, to the first panel uh, session of Privacy Camp 2024. Um, I'm super happy to kickstart uh, this year's edition uh, in company of four excellent speakers. Um, I will introduce them a bit more in details as we go uh, through the flow arc of our conversation today. And before I start with some introductory remarks uh, to set a little bit the scene of the topic that we're going to discuss today, I would like to highlight that three of the four speakers um, could not unfortunately make it to Brussels today to attend in person, so they're joining us remotely, and I hope they will soon appear on the screen. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be hard, a long, long time alone. <laughs> um, and for our online audience, I would like to specifically warn you that the fourth speaker who is with me on stage, Alex, uh, has requested not to appear on the streaming on camera. Um, so do not worry if you hear his voice, but you still see me. It's not a bug. <laughs> Um, it's simply we're respecting his privacy choice. Um, so despite all these engagement barriers, obstacles, uh, I think I can speak on behalf of the five of us um, that we are committed to make this session nonetheless lively and engaging. Um, so now I would like to start setting a little bit the scene for the focus of our conversation today, the digital systems of exclusion in public interest services. Um, I will start with the most obvious, um, with an example. Um, in October 2023, so last year, uh, hundreds of people and 200 NGOs protested against a legislative proposal to oblige all public administrations in Brussels here in the region to offer their services online. Um, and this obviously without the guarantee that other alternatives such as post, welcoming desks, um, and phone lines would be maintained. So there was a huge public outcry and people uh, got to the streets. This year, the year before, the Belgian Digital Inclusion Barometer had concluded that the acceleration of digitalization during the COVID pandemic uh, benefited above all to those who are already socioeconomically and culturally privileged. And so people with lower levels of education, and um, income had suffered the most from the even temporary abolition of physical counters, um, any other kind of offline means to access um, essential services. And today, still half the Belgian population is considered as what they call digitally vulnerable, um, which means they either have no access to the internet or they are, um, don't possess adequate skills. Digitalization has long been justified as a mode of increasing and facilitating access to essential services. It's it served to us like this, with this narrative, and especially include those who are far removed from these services or from any other governmental uh, systems. So it is framed as a practical solution uh, to address existing inequalities through the inter introduction of internet-based services. And so digitalization agendas also come with a certain promise of efficiency uh, to a certain extent, with also the use of algorithmic systems that automate certain parts of administrative decision-making processes. And this in the wider context of public administration, um, public austerity programs. But probably the opposite is true to all of these promises. Uh, often tech systems create new barriers to access uh, services, and they exacerbate the social exclusion of those who are already excluded. Uh, for example, online forms that are not designed to be filled on smartphones, um, while smartphones are actually uh, statistically the only device or the only means um, for people marginalized and excluded to access the internet, like undocumented people, people on the move, or people experiencing poverty. Um, not only does digitalization increase the risk of people not exercising their f basic rights, but it also generates more violence. Um, the integration of algorithm in administrations is often a vehicle for the introduction of more social control through the introduction of surveillance technologies and technologies that have been proven to specifically target racialized communities. 
So technology in the public services undermine fundamental rights in general, the rights to social security and assistance, the right to equity, uh, non-discrimination and dignity. And the introduction of AI systems contribute to embed further what we call hegemonic positions. So rather than stopping inequalities, it seems like technology produced even more. And this is what we're going to question and map today on this panel. Um, the topic is of actually high relevance today. Um, it is an agenda that is largely pushed at European level by the European Commission. Um, there is an impetus from European policies to promote a strong European economy, and that goes with the digitalization of public services. Um, the Commission published in December 2022 its Digital Decade Policy Programme. And one of the core objectives of this policy programme is obviously to reach 100% of key public services um, to be accessible online by 2030. Um, a note on definitions for this panel. We will use inter uh, interchangeably, interchangeably, inter thank you, <laughs> the terms public interest, public, essential or vital services, but you, we all understand what it means. It's basically services that are essential to the enjoyment of social and economical rights and for the participation to civic life. Social welfare, education, health, and so on and so forth. We're not writing an academic paper, thank God, with here, so please be mindful that we are gonna use a variety of terms. They all designate more or less. Um, um, what I just described. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker, a speaker which is uh, Sergio Perez Banco, who is a policy officer at the European Federation of National Organizations working with the homeless. He's leading the Federation's work on youth and LGBTQI plus homelessness. Um, Sergio, if you can hear me, <laughs> FEANSA, yes. your federation, published a policy paper on digital inclusion for homeless people and homeless service <laughs> providers in 2021. Um, this paper, uh, in, in there, you identify a number of benefits uh, that technology brings for homeless people, uh, but you also list quite a number of challenging and additional barriers. Could you tell us how digitalization of public service impact people um, in homelessness, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, perfect. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Chloe, for the introduction. Uh, as you said, uh, I work in FEANSA, uh, which represents uh, NGOs that work at local or national level uh, in the fight against um, homelessness. And, um, and yeah, we have more than 100 members all across Europe and um, and yeah we represent uh, the the rights of the people in homelessness in the European Union and uh, it's been some years that we have been working on on the um, on the link between homelessness and digital transition because uh, right now this this transition is affecting all domains so it's also affecting uh, those who are also more excluded and marginalized like uh, people in homelessness and I think that uh, your question about uh, the digitalization of public services is very, um, it's very interesting because uh, now more and more services, both public and private, are being only digital or digital by default. And this means that uh, for those people that have some barriers or challenges related to their uh, economic conditions, their material deprivation, uh, the, the lack of a uh, housing stabilized situation, etc. Uh, this is really this is really a challenge. Um, what we see is that if these barriers are overcome, uh, it can bring some benefits. Like for example, having updated information about uh, several services. And here we have examples from uh, Copenhagen, uh, from uh, the, the Czech Republic or France. Like um, we have uh, several applications. Uh, where they can access uh, yeah, updated information about the services that people in homelessness use. Also, it can uh, improve the contact with social workers, uh, reminding appointments uh, with uh, the whole social network, uh, etc. And also, like uh, it can even be a tool uh, to look for 
accommodation, to look for jobs, etc. As it happens to any of us nowadays right now that if we want to get a job or if we want to, I don't know, move out to a different place, wherever, uh, we go on the internet and we search for uh, several options. But there are several barriers basically related to uh, affordability of devices, uh, the lack of a stabilized uh, internet connection. Uh, if uh, you go, for example, to libraries or shelters to have uh, uh, free Wi-Fi, uh, the networks are usually not uh, not good enough, uh, or they don't have uh, uh, all the privacy and security checks uh, that uh, that uh, that all the private networks have. Um, and also, there is a matter of digital skills. Uh, if uh, people don't have these these skills, then it's uh, it's quite difficult to to access a number of services. So what we see is that if these barriers are not tackled, um, then uh, digital transition can further exclude uh, people in homelessness. And and yeah, and in the end, um, it can uh, it endangers like the very core principle of equality in accessing public services. So uh, yeah, when states started developing public administration and so on. Uh, one of the very first principles was establishing an equality of uh, access, uh, regardless of um, conditions. So, de facto, uh, this digital transition can really mean that uh, some people would be able to to access uh, some essential services, and some people uh, maybe uh, are not able anymore just because they don't have the economic conditions or the housing or an adequate situation. And that is very, uh, very worrying. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the, the situation already highlights like the, the core issue of access um, and a number of um, problems related to accessibility of the service um, and the, the practicalities. Um, there, as I mentioned in the introduction, there is also a dimension that w once people access uh, the services, there is a new barrier that is created with the use of certain automation tools within uh, decision-making processes. And so second, I am delighted to introduce Nawal Mustafa, who is a legal officer at the Public Interest Litigation Project, PILP. Uh, this is a Dutch organization conducting strategic litigation for fundamental rights. And she is also a research associate um, at the, um, no, sorry, she's a postdoctoral researcher uh, at the Free University of Amsterdam. Um, Nawal, your research interest focuses very much on the Dutch history of slavery and its intersection with law. And so you have been analyzing and, and closely following the theory case in the Netherlands, which is now quite well known. Um, before maybe discussing and going into the, the detail of the, the, the relevance of the case from a racial justice perspective, could you briefly explain for those who haven't followed in detail what the scandal is about and what were the concrete material consequences um, of such use of digital technology um, in the welfare state? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me well? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, perfect. Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me to this session and also for organizing the the 12th, was it the 12th uh, Correct, privacy yes. team? Yeah, so wonderful. I haven't had the opportunity to come um, to any of them. <laughs> so hopefully this will be next year, um, next year hopefully. Um, so just to go into uh, what the Siri case is, it, it was a system... Uh, information system information um, it's called system risk indicator that's the uh, acronym Siri is a risk it, it is a, a risk profiling system used by the Dutch government that linked and analyzed large amount of data personal data of, of citizens so the type of data that was collected through different agencies and ministries and organization governmental organizations are identity employment um, whether you own property or not, what type of education you have, your retirement, um, income, assets, you name it. So anything that you can uh, compile and, and collect 
um, in terms of personal data was used, um, but also, you know, like pension and debt and so on. So, um, and it's, it's a very extensive list of things that they collected from a large amount of organizations. Um, and so this, this, tool that was initially used to kind of prevent um, abuse of social security benefits and to combat um, tax fraud was based on a um, on a law that is meant to prevent social benefit um, social benefit initially it was not based on a law, on a law but um, eventually when concerns were raised by also people within the government um, th there was a legal ground found within the social benefit um, uh, legislation in the Netherlands um, and the problem to just to to to, to I, I want to highlight the fact that uh, technology advan the advances in technology always um, uh, are, faster than the laws. So the laws always have to try to catch up in order to mitigate the harm that is being caused by these technologies that we're using. So this was also the case here. Um, but the problem is with this type of system is that uh, it led to profiling of, of citizens um, and, and kind of and, and spe in specific neighborhoods, namely the neighborhood, two neighborhoods in Rotterdam south, south, and it created so-called wonder addresses with um, which were viewed addresses who would in these neighborhoods, which were viewed as addresses with uh, more risk or increased risk of fraud. So uh, based on the algorithm, there are certain neighborhood selected that is thought to have more that, that is thought to likely commit more fraud wealth of fraud and so on so um and these people were then re included in a register and they could then be subjected to criminal or administrative in investigation and sanctions so initially they didn't do anything there was no suspicious or, or whatsoever but based on the allocate uh, based on the collection of the data and the way the data was analyzed and compiled they were um, perceived to be um, fraudulent uh, or higher risk of fraudulent and um, and, and subjected to could be subjected to administrative and, and sanctions. So the issue is that by perceive, pre, perceiving these people as more or less fraudulent than other neighborhoods or, or people in other neighborhoods, you assume that they are a, a priori suspect, right? So they are suspected. And it takes away the whole presumed innocent um, within the law. You, you cannot assume that everybody within society is basically a suspect. That's what you're creating. And I'm, I'm saying everybody within society, but it's not everybody. It's racialized and, and poor people. So it's, it's, it's specifically targeted to neighborhoods that are not affluent, neighborhoods where the majority of the people who live there are um, have a, uh, a migration background, as we call it in the Netherlands. So I'll just, I think that's a, an introduction to the case. I can say more about that, but I'll leave it uh, for this. Yeah, now, well, can you, uh, did you, are you familiar with some of the consequences this scandal had on the affected families? Like some concrete, so, like what does it mean for them? Yeah, so the thing is, the uh, it was not used, the system was eventually not used because uh, of the litigation case, right? So it didn't really um, lead to a a real material uh, consequences for the families or the people who were um, uh, linked to it. But what I would like to kind of link this case, this is a, a case prior to the uh, child benefit scandal that we've had in the Netherlands. And what you see is um, in that specific case, so it's not the Siri case, but I, um, if you, if the Siri, if the Siri system was used, then I cannot, um, I think it would lead to similar consequences as in the case of the child benefit scandal, um, which also uh, accused some people of um, fraud um, for rece who received a child benefit uh, from the government. Um, and in that case, what you see is that it disproportionately um, had a impact um, uh, on racialized minorities. Again, in the, in the Siri case, you see that the neighborhoods and the people that are being targeted are racialized minorities, right? And poor people. So it's just the combination of class and race that come together in this in, in these uh, circumstances, both in the child benefit scandal and in the in the Siri case. So you see that combination of um, being 
being less affluent and, and being racialized has a very decisive and very important element in uh, who's being impacted by these technologies. Another thing that you saw in the, in the case of the child benefit scandal is that uh, people lost their jobs, people um, lost their companies, they lost their houses, um, they lost their children in some cases because they couldn't um, pay their rent or couldn't pay their mortgage, um, which led, or they didn't have enough money to spend because they, they kept paying the government back for the, for, uh, for the fines that they received and for the the so-called child benefit that they received in a fraudulent manner. So that also led to be children being um, uh, placed outside of the house because uh, the parents no longer were considered to being able to take care for them. So it's not only financial consequences, it's really, really material consequences for people. Thank you so much. And also thank you for bringing the child care benefits scandal, um, which is very informative for the rest of Europe, actually, in how bad things can go. Can go, and and actually this is not an issue that is solely and isolated in the Netherlands, but also very much across EU member states. And this is why now I turn to Alex. Alex is uh, the campaign officer of La Quadrature du Net, uh, who is a mem dream member in France. Uh, and La Quadrature du Net has been uh, mobilizing since 2022, approximately, um, against the use of social control algorithm. Uh, by French public administrations. Um, and um, you, <coughs> sorry, worked to... <laughs> Auto tune. <laughs> um, you worked to reveal how they used um, those algorithms to exclude people and treat basically everyone as a suspect of fraud. Um, Alex, La Quadrature has been mapping the different institutions using algorithm for social control. But you have been focusing on specifically one of them, which is the Caisse Nationale d'Allocation Familiale, la CNAF, um, it, um, the family branch of the French welfare system. And you recently managed to obtain and publish the source code of one of the algorithms used by uh, the CAF. Uh, from, it was used, it's no longer in use, but you're going to explain it to us. Um, can you describe what you discovered by accessing this source code? Hi. Um, so, yeah, at La Quadrature, we work on, on, on that subject, but actually it's really similar to the theory case, and uh, France has been using similar algorithms for uh, quite a long time, in the beginning in the early 2010. Uh, but we took our time to get a look at it, and um, when we began to work on La CNAF, which is a, so the, the French uh, family branch, which also handled the minimum income benefits for the for the for French population. Um, we discovered that this algorithm, the, the CNAF, was the first institution to uh, use such algorithm. But then it was used as a model, and actually this use of uh, risk scoring algorithm to uh, rationalize control, uh, to select people to be controlled, um, has no spread to basically the health branch of the French welfare system and the elderly branch of the French welfare system. So you find it everywhere, very similar algorithm. What we did on the CNAF, uh, the CNAF was a good example because it was the first institution that did it in France, so we had the most uh, documentation on it. And um, there was some research that showed that the introduction of the algorithm led to a rise in the share of the poorest uh, among the people being controlled. So we had some clues that uh, the algorithm was uh, in itself uh, discriminatory. However, then you, you basically we wrote a few papers, um, but you're in this situation where LACNAF like say, okay, no, uh, uh, this isn't true, and you basically, at the end, you need to find the code just to put the, the to publish it and to say uh, to, to the administration that you have to recognize that uh, there is maybe something wrong in it. So we struggled to get the source code and we published it. Uh, How long did it take? One year maybe. Yeah. Right. And the, maybe, okay, one trick for those who work on that subject, because we, okay, so like Naf said, basically if we publish the algorithm, people will begin to cheat, okay, to manipulate their risk scoring. Uh, 
which is something uh, difficult to hear because basically at LACNAF, if you, as we will see, the risk uh, is uh, very high for poor people. So basically, the LACNAF was saying, okay, you will begin to lie on your declaration to act as if you were rich to get minimum income benefits. So this is something like totally. Uh, it's ironic. It's ironic, well, um, well, well. <laughs> it's absurd. Well, absurd, well, absurd. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so the trick that we used, he said, okay, the algorithm was used for 10 years, so we knew that there were several versions of it, and we just went uh, to the French administration that is in charge to decide whether or not uh, you can access some uh, public documents. We just said, okay, give us the oldest, the older versions, that, that are no longer used, and so the CNAF cannot say uh, that people will um, trick on their uh, older, older score. So we, we got it. And what we found, basically, is uh, what, the, what, the, um, what the research showed uh, before, that among the, the factors that were, what, that were used to score people, uh, you had th those that, that will uh, degrade your score will be like uh, low income, uh, unstable employment, uh, being a single mom, uh, living in a poor neighborhood, um, there are some debates because we, we lack some variables, but uh, the CNAF asked to use uh, a variable um, to a variable whether or not you were born in the EU, so to discriminate, you know, uh, foreign people based on your birthplace. Yeah, but based on your birthplace, uh, and so we were able to get it, uh, do some uh, small simulation, you know, of uh, risk scoring, and just to say to the CNAF, okay, now you can no, you can no longer. Um, lie about it, so this is, everyone can, can check what is uh, in the algorithm, and now we are in this place where we are um, waiting for the CNAF reactions. And, uh, so for now, to... they have not reacted to your analysis of the algorithm? They have, they have reacted, and they are still mm, trying to deny everything, which is a bit weird, because the code is a code, I mean, uh, everybody can read it. Um, so the we are. The code doesn't lie. Yeah, the code doesn't lie. <laughs> Only one thing, okay, because we, we are prepared because uh, the problem with the code, but maybe it's uh, too too much details. But you know the problem of proxy. So okay, today they use low income, which is uh, too obvious. You know that it is a discriminatory variable. So we are actually expecting <coughs> the CNAF to change the algorithm to use proxy for low income, you know. And so to maybe one day publish uh, a new version saying, okay, we, we no longer use those and those and those variables, but <coughs> we know that, uh, and maybe this will be another part, but we know that to be efficient, this algorithm needs to focus on people, especially people receiving the minimum income benefits. Uh, and, but we can discuss that later. Yeah. So proxy variables are the... the Problem we may the have next today. Right. The next frontier. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much for exposing the situation in France. Um, I'd like now to go to, to take a step back and introduce our last speaker for this first panel round, uh, who is Carla Prudential Ruiz. And she acts as a technology policy and digital rights researcher for Rhizomatica. Uh, she sits on the board of directors uh, of this organization. And, and she's also an advocacy officer at Privacy International, who is also an entry member. Carla, you've been working for a long time through your work in Rhizomatica with rural and indigenous uh, communities on connectivity issues and digital rights. Um, the idea of digitalization through interconnectivity, we said, was sold as uh, a natural way um, to guarantee inclusion and participation of those that are currently excluded from so society, and in this way, trying to tackle inequalities. And you wrote an article titled, Keeping it Analog, a framework for, for opting out of connectivity with your colleague Peter Bloom. And that can be quite an uncomfortable read for many of us, uh, including the digital rights uh, community. Uh, in this article, you argue that the internet can no longer be seen as this utopic, empowering tool, but connectivity is rather a vector of further fundamental rights violations that also drives inequality and undermines um, cultural self-determination for certain communities. 
Can you share with us this critical perspective that you developed on the paradigm that connectivity has become an end goal? Hi, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here, and I hope I can be like in presence next year, and, and that we can chat around these issues that are like a lot of like that have a lot of complexities. Um, as you were saying, I think my part is like stepping back a little bit, uh, not talking a lot about the use, but also like how we get here. And I, as you were saying, I think we have like two main paradigms. One is that connectivity is always preferable to disconnection. Even this idea of disconnection, we can uh, start uh, testing it because it's not that these communities are disconnected at all, but disconnection for the internet. And the second idea is that, that this means that achieving connectivity uh, is the thing that we need to be taking care of, and it doesn't matter how we achieve connectivity you know like uh, the means doesn't matter because when the access is rich we can start like thinking about like what's happening or how this will develop things or how this will be an enabler for uh, accessing or uh, exercising human rights so i think those uh both things are problematic for uh, several reasons. First, as, as I was saying at the beginning, the concept of digital divide is a is a colonial concept because it divides the world into two sides. The those what are already connected and they are perceived as advanced, as developed, as someone that needs to help the other part of the world which is not connected, it's undeveloped, and it needs to be safe for, from this situation. And uh, also because the other part of the world, those that are not connected, are, are perceived as a, um, like, as a similar group, you know? We are talking about half of the world, more than three billion people, and we think they uh, share some characteristics, and they don't, <laughs> you know, like they are like an heterogeneous group that have different cultures, different realities, different languages, and different like even goals around this issue of digital technologies, Dif different dreams, how they want to do it, why they want to do it. So we are treating this half of the world as if it was some uh, homogeneous thing and it is not so that's other thing that is problematic because we are thinking the solutions of bridging the digital gap um, as if they were solutions uh, one fits all and uh, that's not true and the third one is what you were saying that is the this idea that connectivity is about being able to participate more fully in society or in an economy or uh, accessing some human rights and as you all were saying that's not necessarily true and uh, with connectivity we can also like um, say that digital technologies are not necessarily like bringing these issues but also a lot of risks that we are not talking a lot about uh, in the connectivity world and um, the initial hope that this was like internet was this decentralized architecture that will allow everyone to join and to be like to express themselves and to access to information and to be able to get services, public services. We have um, a lot of proofs that it's not necessarily true now. A few companies own the upper and lower layers of internet connection. Like we are not only thinking about like um, applications or social networks, but also a few companies own the cables, like the infrastructure itself, which is uh, problematic. And we can also see now that uh, internet allows a lot of inequalities and the, for example, the erosion of privacy in these communities and like for all uh, people. 
that uh, they allow surveillance of, for government uh, and also companies, and they allow a lot of the inequalities that you were talking about. So we are, I mean, for example, in the pandemic, in the COVID, we, we all saw that everyone was turning their projects into connectivity. Uh, a lot of like funds were developed on that. A lot of organizations start like working on that because we we thought like this is the thing we need to do. And like you were saying, I've been working on this project for a long time. It's not that I'm not like, uh, yeah, I'm part of the problem, I think. But the issue was like how we can stop and see if we can do better and think about internet, digital, digital tools as also a uh, thing that we can be scared of. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, it, it's about time also to realize and uh, reflect on our own position in in when we run projects, uh, making sure that it actually serves people. So I think it's a very v a valuable reflection that you're sharing with us. Um, and it's, it's really good that you highlighted really how digitalization is sort of a symptom of the structural violence of the colonialist and um, capitalist systems. And this is where we tie in with uh, the, uh, the theme of privacy camp. It's really trying to uncover the societal and economic uh, systems that underlie or hide behind those technologies. And maybe this is a really good transition to come back to Alex for uh, looking at the CNAF algorithm. Um, La Quadrature has framed uh, the, the, the algorithm you uncovered as a technological alibi for an unfair policy, which I think is a very good summary of what we're trying to, to show here. Um, and the algorithm is inherently discriminatory because the policy it serves is inherently discriminatory. Can you explain a little bit the political nature of this algorithm and why it is um, considered discriminatory? Uh, yes. The <laughs> uh, uh, maybe on two, two parts. Uh, the first one is how the, the uh, alibi part is how the um, manager of the uh, of CNAF used the algorithm, you know, to valorize the valorize the, the own work. So basically, when they introduced it in 2012, um, they increased the profit profitability of uh, of controls, and and we come back to that just after. And they started to um, to publish, you know, uh, reports showing that uh, their control were more and more efficient, and they were very proud of their of their new algorithm. And they sold, you know, the the view of a modernizing modern administration using uh, data mining and, and AI uh, to to rationalize control. However. <coughs> While doing so, they never opened the black box of the algorithm. So basically, they were not saying that they were targeting that to get more money out of the control, that they were targeting the most poorest of the of the people that they are supposed to help. Actually, the French family branch of the welfare French system is supposed to help the the people in need. Yeah. Uh, so the alibi was to say, okay, we have something, but we don't say uh, what's inside, you know, the, what, what the internal of the, of the algorithm, what, what, what was the violence that was created by this algorithm. And um, uh, this is only now, you know, that, that, that we published the algorithm that uh, they are saying, okay, uh, the first thing that they changed in, in, the, in the public uh, discourse, that they said that before, in 2010, they, they were saying that the algorithm was used to fight, to fight fraud, okay? So when we say that, okay, so now you, you're, being, you're basically saying that the poorest are more uh, prone to fraud, the CNAF just said, okay, no, no, it's not that, it's not used to fight fraud, okay, to the, the risk score is not the probability of being a fraudster, it's the probability of getting undue benefit, which is true, which is in the, in the data, how it was uh, trained. And what is interesting here is that, uh, that maybe, is that actually the, um, The algorithm, the way it was trained, so it was a data mining basic algorithm with a training data set of, of, uh, of uh, people that were... Uh, historical data from... Historical data from, from LACNAF. And 
the fact that the more porous, uh, especially the people living on, on minimum income benefit, are receiving minimum income benefit, were more likely to uh, receive, to, to, to have undue benefit. Undue payments. Undue payments. So they're undue paid, payments. They're ah, paid too overpaid. much, well. and now and the administration realized they've been paid too much, so need exactly. to pay back. Exactly. So when you do control, you ask uh, for uh, some uh, money back, you know. Uh, the CNAF knew well, well, well before it developed the algorithm that undue payment, undue, undue payment were concentrated on minimum income benefits because minimum income benefits are the most complex uh, benefits are the, the benefits with the most most complex rules. Okay, why minimum income benefits have the most complex rules in France? It's because it's accumulation of uh, basically far right uh, or right uh, legislation saying, okay, uh, the poor will use uh, uh, French welfare system, so we need to <coughs> introduce more stringent rules, you know, to make sure that only the good poor. Receive, uh, receive money. So at the end, what you have is that you have an algorithm that is, 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 is efficient in basically targeting the most poorest. And what it does is that it reveals the complexity of the rules that, are, that is itself a consequence of... Um, right-wing policies? Of right-wing policies, <laughs> okay. Lutte contre la système. Uh, oh, that is a complicated <laughs> one. Uh, but like the... the um, general policy to go against um, unemployed people um, being well. considered as lazy and so on. I don't, I don't know how to... Exactly, exactly. So, so, voilà. so in a sense, just the algorithm is a reflection of something much more, of something totally political. Uh, and, uh, and this is exactly why we say that the CNAF cannot uh, improve the algorithm, it cannot make the algorithm not discriminatory, because for the algorithm to be efficient, it has to target the poorest. So we, we are waiting for uh, some modification, as, we, as I was saying before, we, we are waiting for the introduction of proxy and the removal of the, the most uh, offensive uh, variables. Controversial voilà. vari variables. But, but, but the very nature of the algorithm, because it reflects the nature of the French social uh, system, uh, has to target those people, has to be discriminatory to be efficient. So this is the end. Right. And you said it's profitable because that was for CNAF a very political choice to go after undue payment because it, they would gain more. Like they would be more prof profitable, yeah, but, is what you said. Uh, and this is well, the, the end of the story is that actually, and this is where we've, uh, the, uh, this is uh, one of the key insights of uh, what we did at La Quadrature on that subject is that we were saying, okay, control has always existed in the French uh, social system. So basically you're saying, okay, what does it change to uh, make it, uh, to, to control people based on the risk current, you know? What, what does it change, what, uh, philosophically? And uh, what we realized is that before the, the introduction of the algorithm, uh, manager of LACNAF had to meet, you know, and to decide, okay, this year we're going to uh, control 30% uh, of uh, minimum income benefits uh, people, but we will also control a bit of uh, the other, you know, uh, population that we, to which we give uh, benefits. So they had to be uh, accountable, you know, for the, for, the, for, the disc for the choice they made to control uh, some population more than other. As soon as the, as the algorithm was introduced, Basically, the share of uh, marginalized people being controlled could increase because everybody was saying it's not us, it's the algorithm. You know? And nobody knows what is inside the algorithm. And we have tons and tons of uh, documents on that. We have even a, a quote from a controller saying it's not me that says that I will control 500 uh, minimum income benefit recipients, it's the algorithm. And this is also another side of the technological alibi yeah. that you find. You, n nobody has no longer the responsibility to for the for the for the policy itself, and for the outcomes, for and the for the outcomes, yeah. Yeah. which is maybe. Uh, uh, right. Thank you, Alex. Um, now, well, the the Siri case is also a very good illustrative case uh, for that. Uh, how technology reinforces discriminatory policies and how they, they feed into them. How do you see this automated punishment approach? Uh, in social welfare as a form of racialized surveillance and criminalization? 
Yeah, so as I said, it really connects to, you know, um, uh, the specific neighborhoods that are being targeted. Neighborhoods are used as a proxy to for race and class both. Um, but I think a more fundamental point that I would like to uh, say that connects both to what Alex was saying, but also what's happening in the Netherlands broader in relation to, you know, this specific um, case, but also in uh, other cases, the child uh, benefit, uh, the child care benefit scandal, but also, you know, recently we had Follow the Money published a report about uh, the city of Rotterdam using um, uh, ethnicity in order to kind of uh, predict whether somebody is likely to commit a violent crime or not. Um, so you have all of these algorithms that are being used. And I think the more fundamental point that I'm interested in and I'm kind of thinking about um, with all of these cases, and it really came up to me again as Alex, as I heard Alex speak, is the issue of for who is the welfare state and who, from whom does it need protection. And that has been crucial from the, in, in, from the first moment that the, the, the notions of welfare state were created, right? So it was always... It, it's always pre presented as something that will help the poor and so on and so forth and provide a lot of these social um, uh, assistance that people might need. But um, what you see is that as that, that notion is present in as, as these institutions are all being set up, you know, um, at the same time, there is this uh, notion of that these institutions are simultaneously at, um, at a risk. Uh, they are being threatened. Uh, first, with before you know, large majorities of racialized populations were living in European cities. You see that it's the poor white Europeans who are, um, uh, you know, who are presenting a risk to to the to the the stability and the existence of these institutions. It's meant for them, but they're also a risk. So I I, I think this type of contradiction continuously existed and continues to exist. Um, the 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 only thing that is m maybe interesting in you know the digital space is how digital technologies are now being used more and more in order to maintain that um, that outlook on welfare state and welfare institutions. So I think it it is, uh, and that's where you know the colonialism and also uh, capitalism come into play, right? It's it's a continuum. It's not a something. It's not something novel or something new, um, and that's what you continue to see. And um, the point that Alex was making about nobody's taking responsibility. Um, I mean. Uh, Theoretically, automated uh, decision making should be checked by somebody, by a human being, so that otherwise um, it's 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 um, uh, unlawful. But at the same time, the people themselves that are supposed to doing the checks do not understand where the data comes from and what the data is doing. So then, um, how can they actually assess the harms and so on? So it's it's not necessarily that their task is to kind of check where their harms are coming. And that's more and more uh, becoming my analysis. It's more to see if the system is working or not. And I don't think they are they care about what the system, the negative in, impact that the system is doing. So because the Siri case was struck out before it was outrolled throughout the country, um, I like to uh, build on the examples that I have from the child care uh, benefit scandal. And there what you see is, okay, so for instance, if I am being targeted by Siri or this other um, issue and, and they perceive me as a fraudulent person, um, I will get a letter in Informing me of that, uh, that letter uh, is oftentimes automated. Um, you react to that letter, but then you go into these complaint mechanisms that continuously say, "This is how it works. This is what the system said," um, and and there's no way for you as an individual or as a collective to actually go to battle to that. And that's what the child care benefit scandal in the Netherlands actually showed. And it showed that all of the institutions institutions that were supposed to have checks and balances in place do actually not function, do not function like that. So um, even the courts, the courts in, in, in the case of uh, these, in, in, because it's an administrative issue, the courts are not checking um, um, they are there we we call it an, a, a marginal test they they 
they, they do this marginal test, which is basically they check whether the law is applied in a consistent and coherent manner in a, in a normal, in a, in a good manner. That's it. It's not, they're not checking whether, um, uh, what the facts are and what the circumstances are and so on. So afterwards, when once all of these people's lives have been damaged and um, been impacted on so negatively. That's when we have a collective awareness thinking about, oh, maybe we should have done more as courts, as you know, like all of the instances of the courts, but also within the institutions that are using these data uh, driven um, systems and so on. So what I see is also not only a lack of um, um, responsibility, but also lack of Unwillingness, basically, it's not lack; it's unwillingness and and unawareness of the deep impact these institutions, um, these these um, uh, technologies have. And I think that unwillingness comes from this long colonial history of you know and and uh, colonial capitalist history, where the the welfare system always should be protected from the people that it should be serving. So that's the the kind of the the contradiction that I continue continue to see, and that has been there. So. Yeah, and it's so it's really well how you explain how this reverse uh, uh, ideology is taking place is has also like colonial roots and and yeah. and racist roots. Um, mm -hmm. I think it really kind of confirms how technologies codify racialized surveillance and and control. Um, yeah. and, and there is also, in what you mentioned, this lack of actually existing effective remedies is very telling in, in the impact on the most marginalized and, and racialized communities. Um, there is also something that I would like to highlight in how the, um, the introduction of such technologies uh, in, in public services and in the welfare state, as you described, um, it, it's normalizing a punitive approach. We, we yeah. go, like, it's exactly what you're describing. It, it's protecting the social welfare state against those that are supposed to benefit from it. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it takes the form of, a, of punition, of sanctions. Um, and this normalization of sanctions was never actually open to debate uh, of democratic decision. Um, and there is no quite uh, good layout of evidence for the efficiency mm. of such a punitive approach in the welfare state. And so digitalization of public services for me also imposed kind of an undemocratic shift in the public sector in terms of how we decide to go about how to assist people, how we go about social security. And it really puts a focus on preemptive intervention based on prediction, based on a systematic punitive response. Um, and so it has a, a concrete impact on how we allocate funding, public funding in the social uh, welfare state. And, but it also has concrete impact on the mission of people working in welfare functions. Um, and there was one article um, dra drafted in Belgium again by a journalist from the independent media Medor, an investigative um, magazine. And uh, one of the social workers she interviewed said, We've all well we always dealt with administrative problems, but now playing the role of public service secretaries is preventing us from carrying our mission of providing emancipatory social support. Sometimes I get the impression that the authorities are hoping that people don't exist anymore. Um, I want to turn on to Sergio and ask you whether any of your members of your, of your federation that provide services to people in homelessness, how do they see their, their social work impacted by the growing uh, injunction of digital mediation? So you have to be on, on digital service and how they are forced to supporting people um, in going online. Um, how do they, th does it impact their core mission of assistance, of uh, social support? So, as I said, it's also like uh, impacting a lot uh, social work <laughs> and uh, the work to provide yeah, um, kind of autonomy uh, for uh, for people in homelessness. Um, and 
in many in many service providers and um, yeah and many uh many social workers like are currently doing this job of digital mediation etc uh and they see it uh, like uh in um kind of uh, they see the two sides of the coin uh they see that uh it is very often necessary uh for people excluded in order to access rights uh so this work on digital mediation is seen as a tool for uh autonomy uh so it's it's seen as a useful tool and maybe like a another part of their of their job but on the other side uh sometimes they are not uh, trained enough uh in order to provide this uh this kind of help uh there is like still like a big gap uh in uh, social education and social work schools uh, across europe about uh about this uh digital uh, mediation and digital stuff and um and sometimes they they also see that um instead of uh, doing their uh actual job uh of providing more resources in terms of uh helping in uh, uh psychosocial support in helping in job counseling helping to find stable accommodation etc sometimes they see that they lose most of the time trying to help people manage uh online forms uh trying to uh yeah look for or um or uh, or get uh, devices uh, in order to uh, to to do all these kind of uh, procedures online, uh, be it with public but also with private services. So they see like the the two sides of the of the of the coin, like sometimes as a tool for for autonomy and as part of of their job, and uh, also like uh, sometimes with kind of um, fears that um, that this will uh, impact negatively the core of their of their work, and there are also like many many concerns in terms of uh, privacy and uh, personal information, also related to uh, to uh, increasing demands from public services. For example, when uh, public welfare systems uh, fund uh, homeless service providers, uh, they may request uh, kind of uh, basic uh, data or demographics about people that are hosted in shelters, for example. And then this burden uh, is put on the social workers that are uh, working in these services. And um, sometimes, for example, if they are asked to, to collect uh, data on a family situation or migration status, this is actually very, uh, very delicate information and very concerning in terms of privacy. So uh, in the end, it's uh, social workers that are put in a position that they are not supposed to be. And um, and yeah, this this all relates to the to the debates that uh, you were all talking about uh, um, politicization of uh, public welfare systems. This kind of uh, suspect that people that request uh, welfare benefits or social services are kind of uh, uh, not uh, not good enough in order to access them. Also, it concerns the digital divide that Carla was talking about. Uh, so, of course, like. Uh, for people who are social excluded, uh, digital exclusion can even like further exacerbate all the negative outcomes. So, um, so yeah, we, we I think that we really need to challenge this narrative that uh, uh, digital technologies are always good, no matter what, because uh, we see that it's not the case always. Absolutely, and I think it's very powerful when you describe how social workers are uh, kind of obliged to enforce uh, a policy that they haven't chosen or they don't maybe probably wouldn't uh, support uh, to actually carry out their job and they mm -hmm. they turn into like data collectors for the the welfare state um, so that put them in a very bad situ uh, situation um last question of this second um, panel round and then i will open the floor for questions from the audience so i invite you to think if you ever want to uh, ask a specific question to one of our panelists um i want to give the floor to Karna um, and asking you further on your view on the transformation of the public sector's core mission that we just described um, and how it is uh, often accompanied by a spiraling influence. I stole that from my colleague, Sarah, a spiraling influence of the private sector 
in public areas because they are often the one offering the technical solutions. Um, so it, it really allows the private company to shape the services themselves and give them a lot of discretion and power ho about how they're designed and how they're rolled out. Um, so how do you see this power grab by private actors um, in the field of internet connectivity? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a really interesting question with the background that we already have uh, for the previous speakers, because as as we were saying, when we envision a technology or connectivity as the goal itself, it doesn't matter how you achieve it. And sometimes you achieve it or, or we can see the tendency of achieve it with a lot of influence of private actors uh, in the connectivity uh, ecosystem is it is clear uh, one that we said like we need to um, to re like to shrink the digital divide uh, at all costs a lot of actors are entering to this uh, you have governments you have communities itself that are also having their own systems that is it's, it's important to recognize they have their community networks their own infrastructure, but also we have some private actors, some companies that are uh, entering to the to the to the space. And if we said like, okay, the the people that it's not already connected are those that cannot afford it, or uh, that are like racially excluded, or a lot of exclusion you can see there, or maybe they don't want, but they are not profitable enough. For companies to enter to this space so the next question is why they are doing it <laughs> and we can see that they are doing it because they think in a different business model more related with data extraction with surveillance um, campaigns with a lot of things that are like uh, closely related with erosion of privacy and human rights so the relationship there, like you, we need to understand what is like the things that we are giving when we allow these companies to start connecting or start introducing these new technologies. And like the, I'm, I don't know, like the famous case is like Facebook, Facebook with uh, his this program, uh, Free Basics, which was like designed to connect communities um first they weren't providing internet they were just providing some access to some platforms which is by definition it's not internet we have a lot of problems with net neutrality there but whatever and also they are extracting a lot a lot of data for the communities so i think that's a big issue of how private actors are reshaping this. And if we can see like, like that we are uh, increasingly using the internet as a vehicle in the best cases, but sometimes as a substitute of providing a public service or a, access a human right, for example, in health services, but also in education or even in welfare systems, like if you are using this vehicle, we can also see that increasingly states and governments are focusing more on how we will acquire the digital tool or how we will connect this community because we like this is i call it like the internet band-aid like it helps to everything so they are not focusing on the structural inequalities that are behind these issues but because they have like a easy solution or a easy fix which is like okay, we cannot provide education, which is something really difficult, structural and inequality that is there. So we will provide internet because whatever, we can have like a, a specific program or um, education system there. So they are like starting to substitute like uh, these things. And also as uh, as you were saying like the fonts are like focus on this and if you focus like if you start like following the money and starting to say like what's happening why uh, instead of like giving books they are using facial recognition in schools because they think that's the way they can tackle uh, in assistance uh, like they can tackle people 
a missing school, you know? So they will put like a facial recognition system instead of putting an extra teacher who cares more about this. So the fonts are also like um, are being misused by states mm -hmm. with the same narrative behind that this will solve everything. And that means like a lot of private actors trying to profit from this issue. And we need to say, well, how they are profiting about this. And the, the, the solution is they are eroding a lot of human rights and they are increasing inequality in a lot of cases. Um, when, do, when was Facebook Free Basics program started? Do you know? Yeah, a long time ago, but now actually they they don't do it. Uh, it. It started like 10 years ago, actually. But now they are also providing infrastructure, which is another <laughs> like complete problem because they are not only providing like um, connectivity itself, but they also own the cables. And in Peru, for example, they have like a partnership with the state they uh, to provide internet. Also, they have this initiative called uh, internet.org, which wasn't internet at all. Again, it was just like access to some of their platforms and some of the, the pages. But yeah, they were using these initiatives to connect the world, but they were not connecting to, 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 to the whole net. Yeah, and they are now uh, owning more and more, which we can see it's a problem also with vertical mergers because they own the infrastructure, they own the content, and then uh, they own the final users, which is problematic. <laughs> And this is how we see how it brilliantly aligns capitalist interests in, uh, aligned with political goals and, um, and agendas. Um, thank you so much for describing how uh, concretely uh, private actors take advantage of uh, this type of policies and the further inclusion of technologies uh, in them. I will now open the floor for questions. Otherwise, I have remaining ones anyway, but uh, I would like to give you the opportunity since we have a bit less than 15 minutes um, for audience questions to, our, um, to this topic. Over there, and then Mr. We have two, so do I need to stand up? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Kirsten Fiedler. I work for Alexandra Gese, Greens MEP in the Parliament. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, super interesting discussion and input. Um, I'm a bit surprised that the AI Act wasn't mentioned yet. So <laughs> my big question as a policy nerd is uh, what does the AI Act bring? Um, I know it's, it's not the magic one to get rid of uh, all of the problems created by capitalism, but um, yeah, will, will there be uh, any like improvement in France or in the Netherlands and what needs to happen in terms of enforcement in the member states? Thank you. Thank you, I'll take the second question. Uh, uh, Shuvan, there is just one question. Um, the person just right there was second. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Morakio from uh, Tech Hive Advisory. Um, quickly, my question is for the, the French and the Dutch scenario, um, especially the Dutch scenario, uh, the Siri case. Um, I remember reading the case and the courts mentioned something about um, the transparency being the issue, um, that if uh, uh, Siri was uh, transparent with the 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 data they possessed, uh, it could have been uh, in, a, in a better situation. Uh, but my concern or my, my thought is that um, would uh, transparency about the kind of data they've collected uh, be enough uh, to justify the abundance of uh, information they have about citizens? Because it literally said that um, uh, for the, um, the government to, to fight fraud or corruption, they can possess or they can inquire or research about any kind of data, as long as they are, they are, they are combating fraud. So, uh, yeah, you, you know, saying, you know, be transparent about it, have a log to the citizens to see the kind of data they have. Is that enough to justify uh, the possession of this kind of information? Uh, thanks. Thank you. Is there another question then? 
No, then I will, yeah, yeah, we'll collect the third one. Yes, uh, thank you so much to all the speakers. My question, I think it's probably most directed to Sergio and his work, um, because I was wondering, um, looking at the upcoming um, EIDAS um, regulation and implementation, how um, digital identity management is going to affect um, especially people who have uh, already hard time accessing uh, digital services. Thanks. Thank you. I'll turn to the guest speakers then. Uh, who wants to go first? So we have a question on a very, very nerdy, two nerdy questions on one of the AI Act and whether this will, we have the hope that this will change the situation. One question on transparency and whether access to the data could change anything, if I can summarize this this well, or not, not enough. Um, like, is it, is it justified that the state collects that much data to fight fraud and corruption, and will transparency improve the situation? Um, and then the third question on, again, on the new, uh, well, not so new anymore, but like um, recently adopted, I think, EIDAS regulation and their impact on the homeless people. Who wants to go first? Maybe Nawal on the Siri case? Yeah. yeah, I can go on the Siri case. Obviously, I completely agree with the person who asked the question. Um, I don't think transparency uh, alone is enough. And I think this is where the work has to be done in terms of connecting um, these issues to, you know, racial racial um, marginalization, uh, the history of colonialism and capitalism and so on. So if you look at it as purely a, a privacy issue um, and the collection of data issue or a digital issue, you won't see these um, historical continuities and so on. So then um, then it, it, it might seem that when the government says, well, we will be transparent and we will share all of the data that we have collected and how we collect it, that might be enough. I don't think that's enough. And I think more advocacy and more um, uh, work, um, uh, maybe litigation is needed in order to kind of um, show these continuities and, and, and so on. So, and what I want to say is the law is a tool that you can use to kind of um, push forward, but it's not a tool that will solve the problems. It's as I said at the beginning of the session, it's usually behind on these developments, right? So um, going through the legal venue is sometimes good, but sometimes also not not that good. So it's it, it depends on what you want to reach, and I think um, you, by continuously bringing forward the issues that I brought forward during this panel, you might be able to push and show why only. Uh, being transparent is enough and also I think there's also uh, a need to also educate judges in these cases and, 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 and so on. So not enough and I agree with you with the question. Thank you. Uh, you want to answer on the French system? I totally agree with what, what you just said and, uh, and, and, and so we fight, we, we fight for transparency just to be able to denounce what's uh, happening in France. So we need transparency in a sense, but then it's not enough, it's, it's for sure. And, and actually, we are preparing, you know, the low, low legal, uh, legal action uh, against the algorithm. And then we are exactly facing the same question, which is like, uh, um, what's going to, to happen? We don't want to win on transparency because, uh, okay, you give transparency and you leave the situation. We don't... But I even even if we and and the big question maybe is around the discrimination of the, of the algorithm. But actually, as we were saying just before, the algorithm in, in France, at least, I don't know in the in the theory case how it was trained, or it, it's really the reflection of of the um, of the French uh, social system uh, in our workings. You know the, the world. So at, at the end. It's efficient because the, the so if you say okay the algorithm is discriminatory so you have to drop it then uh, how do you organize your control so you have to realize that your social system itself is discriminatory and then you go much much uh, deeper you know in the in, in the issue so it's like okay we can drop the algorithm but at the end what we hope is that we it, it asks a question about the, the the system itself just as as you said. Thank you. Uh, maybe Sergio on the EIDAS? 
Well, first, let me to say that um, I don't know the details of the EIDAS, uh, but uh, what can I say is that uh, the problems with uh, electronic identification um, is that you need like many requirements to do that. For example, if you want to log online in a computer and so on, maybe you need a card reader. Maybe there is like a verification system with your mobile phone, either through SMS or with uh, or with a specific application, etc. And this is this is already like an exclusionary factor. Why? Because uh, people in homelessness don't always have like a constant access to a to a laptop computer. And even if they have like more access or it's easier to to have access to a to a smartphone, um, sometimes there is not like a internet connection, or this is very limited, or there is like a, a lack of a, how do you say availability in terms of uh, charging stations. Like uh, you need to uh, uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, uh, people that are facing housing exclusion they don't have access to these kind of very basic uh, things that are necessary in order to run all this uh, all this equipment. Um, so you need to constantly think, uh, like uh, people facing these situations need to constantly think about uh, where to charge my device later, where could I connect to the internet, like uh, maybe uh, sometime later, do I have access now or not? So uh, it's uh, it's already a barrier and uh, if it um, if this legislation uh, is only pushing in that direction without any alternative or any uh, yeah any other option to opt out, uh, it will mean only more more exclusion, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, wondering on the AI Act question, which is a tricky one. Um, Carla, have you followed the AI Act? Yes. Yes, but I yeah, <laughs> I can I can answer that even if it was not Good necessarily. Luck. <laughs> then not. Uh, <laughs> um, Alex, do you have some words on the act? What do you hope from this European legislation? What's your hopes? Ooh. That that. Uh, I didn't work directly on the AI Act. I just know that with Edwi, we pushed for some amendments to basically prohibit the use of um, social scoring uh, algorithm to fight fraud. Uh, I think it's, uh, it was a failure. <laughs> so this was my point. And, and more generally, at La Quadrature, we kind of oppose the AI Act and the, all the risk-based approach of the, of the AI Act. Uh, so... Actually, the way I see it is that uh, lo just looking at the risk risk um, scoring algorithm, I see it as a more as a risk for the for setting you know uh, something to spread this kind of technology. Because actually, in France, just one word maybe on that, uh, the way it was developed, it was developed like totally out of of any legal um, basis. legal um, basis. So actually, we know that today, in a sense, we could have a quick win, you know, and and maybe. Uh, um, okay, attack one algorithm and, and, and uh, voila. But I think the AI Act will actually give a much more strong, stronger legal basis to for this practice. So, so you don't see it as positive that it risks legitimization, a promotion, an endorsement uh, of this type yeah, by so. providing a legal basis. Okay, yes. very negative take. Carla, is Carla back? Now we're waiting. Yeah. For for her to connect. Yeah, sorry, I had like... We like have one minute left, Carla. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will say just like the AI Act, I think it's like important to see how it really will work with these issues. As, as Noel was saying, it's not only like the policy and regulation of this stuff. Like I, I cannot do like a full criticism of the act here, but also like how these issues are usually um seem like at the same time they are uh yeah copying or or ad, uh, uh, are enacting the issues that are systematically there before the technology so it's not only focusing on how we will regulate the technology but how we will solve the issues behind it that will say that 
Thank you very much. And I have no time left to follow up on this, but like I want to close um, this session by um, thanking first the speakers. So I invite you to join me in a round of applause. Thank you so much. And as a last word, I just wanted to say that it's super important Like this panel is kind of an invitation to think this topic through a bit more um, because we need to focus on what the impacts are and debunking this myth that digitalization is de facto good for everyone. We need to work with those who are the most affected. So it's, a, it's also a call for the digital rights community in this space um, and, and, and our partners here um, to work together on this issue in the coming year and, and bring some um, strong recommendation and resistance um, to these developments. Thank you so much.